Welcome everyone to today's event. Today we're talking about the national strategy for volunteering, specifically the first focus area, individual potential and the volunteer experience. My name is Zach Reimers. I'm the director of the national strategy for volunteering, and we have a few co-presenters today who will be introducing along the way as well. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. Although we're meeting online, uh, the vast majority of us are living, working, operating and joining this meeting from lands across Australia. So I'm tuning in from Brisbane or Mianjin, and that's the land of the Yagara and Turrbal speaking peoples. Uh, several of my colleagues are in Canberra and that's the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to the elders past and present, and you may wish to chime in in the chat and acknowledge the traditional custodians from where you're joining us for today's session. So as discussed, today is a session on the national strategy for volunteering to kick things off for 2024. Uh, so what is the National Strategy for Volunteering? We cover this in each event. I make it a little bit slimmer every time because um, hopefully we're building up that uh, knowledge base across the volunteering ecosystem. So the National Strategy for Volunteering, it's a 10 year blueprint. It's a national strategic framework. It comes from over 12 months of consultations with uh, dozens of meetings, hundreds of people, um, and it provides a clear and compelling case for change to achieve a better future. And the sum total of all those consultations arrived at one key vision, which is to make volunteering the heart of Australian communities. Hopefully you're all familiar with the national strategy. If you haven't, now's a great time or after the event to look it up, download a copy yourself and uh, read through and, and see what it says about the vision there to make volunteering the heart of Australian communities uh, from 2023 to 2033. So how would we achieve that vision? Well, the national strategy is split up into three focus areas. So these are individual potential and the volunteer experience, community and social impact, and conditions for volunteering to thrive. In addition, these focus areas are associated with 11 strategic objectives across those focus areas. And those strategic objectives provide more detail on what actually needs to happen to achieve the national strategy for volunteering, its vision, aligning with those three focus areas. And today we're focusing in on number one, individual potential in the volunteer experience. But what do we mean by that? Well, there is some text available in the national strategy, but I would really like to uh, shine a spotlight on Sarah Wilson, who I'm sure is a familiar name and face to everyone in this room. Uh, Sarah was the director of the national strategy during the development phase and is still a really key member of the team. Um, and you, would recognize Sarah, if not from anything else, from the launch of the national strategy in uh, February last year. And so who better to talk about Focus Area 1? I'd like to hand over to colleague Sarah. Can you please take us through Focus Area 1 and, and a little bit behind it? Thanks, Zach, and hello everyone, especially to all of the names I recognize in the chat from that year I was across the country hearing from all of you. So um, this morning, Zach's asked me, or this afternoon, I should say, to present a little bit about what we mean by this particular focus area. And I think one of the really interesting things that emerged out of the consultations that we did over that time was in getting people to reflect not just on their volunteers that they work alongside, but their own experiences, that this focus was something that can be lacking in organisations, but actually plays a key role in whether or not volunteers enjoy what they're doing, feel like it's a good use of their time and decide to stick around. So at the highest level, this strategic objective is really about making sure that volunteering is safe, inclusive, accessible, meaningful, and not exploitative. And the um, national strategy actually talks about this as being one of the most critical success factors to achieve over the next 10 years. And the reason for that is that we know that if people have a good volunteer experience, they will stick around and they will also become advocates for the volunteering program. Um, word of mouth is still one of the primary ways that people get involved in volunteering. And so volunteers are actually the advocates that are the ones that can provide essentially a peer review of that experience to those who are interested in joining. Without a good experience, we also know that not only do volunteers leave, if they've had a negative experience of volunteering, but they are likely to dissuade and disencourage others from getting involved. So in that way, it can actually detract from your volunteering programs um, because you have uh, maybe people out in the community who are saying that it didn't meet their expectations or provide them with the experience they were looking for. 
So what does it actually mean? At the highest level, it's that volunteering needs to be inclusive and accessible. And the reason for that is that people are looking for a uniquely, usually profoundly personal experience through volunteering. What we heard from conversations that we had, but I'm sure resonates with people who have volunteered themselves, is that when you have the opportunity to contribute to causes that you care about, whether that's participating in community sport on the weekend, uh, doing micro volunteering online through citizen science, or doing something really hands-on like planting uh, trees in your local neighbourhood, if it is something you care about, you are more likely to be intrinsically motivated to have a good experience through volunteering. Um, but without it being inclusive and accessible, we know that a lot of volunteering remains inaccessible for those who have a lot to give and would gain uh, many benefits from the experience itself. We also heard throughout consultations that we, people want opportunities to volunteer across the lifespan. And another reason that the experience is such a pivotal part of volunteering is that people tend to come in and out of volunteering at different points in time, depending on their life circumstances. So we always see a peak in the statistics for parents with school age children who come back to volunteering because they might be on the PNC or running their local soccer team. Um, and people tend to do different kinds of volunteering at different points to depending on their circumstances. So again, that experience is pivotal in whether or not across that lifespan, people will continue to return to volunteering when they have the time um, and essentially the availability to be involved. So underneath this particular strategic objective, sorry, this focus area, there are three strategic objectives. Um, and the third one around making sure that volunteering is not exploitative is also making sure that volunteering roles are appropriate. Um, not only do they align with their work guidelines around what is considered volunteering, but also that we're not asking volunteers to do too much or something that might look like paid work. Um, and we're not focusing on this part of it too much, but we made sure that it was in the strategy because we recognise that Sometimes not all volunteering is good. Um, we tend to focus on the good news stories as we should, um, and that's what much of today is about. But we also need to recognise that sometimes volunteering can take advantage of people uh, in ways that might be unintended but have um, adverse consequences, not just for the volunteers, but also organisations and the community itself as well. So what does the evidence say? It's really interesting because a lot of the research in volunteering tends to focus on organisations, um, and that can be due to access. Uh, it's sometimes easier to talk to organisations that have paid employees working in volunteering. But a lot of the conversations that we had through the development process was really anecdotal evidence. So it was talking to people about what their volunteers told them, um, but also what their experience was as a volunteer themselves. And one of the things that we heard and continues to come up through the research we're able to do is that there can be a mismatch between what people want to do as a volunteer and what roles are available. And some of that's a marketing issue. Um, some of it's that people don't necessarily see themselves in the roles that are available. But also it speaks to the fact that people are looking for particular activities through volunteering that they would find fun or enjoyable or meaningful and don't necessarily know where to direct their energy and attention when they don't immediately see roles that resonate with their motivation which leads into the second uh, sort of main thing that we know about what is a good volunteer experience, which is that when people's motivations are met, they are likely to stay in a role and remain satisfied. Um, so many people probably remember as part of the national strategy, we did um, a series of volunteering research papers. Um, and one of those, I actually worked with Dr. Arthur Stukas, who is, um, has done lots of research over time on measuring volunteer motivations. Um, and that paper's on our website if anyone hasn't seen it. But what we know is that people are motivated to volunteer for such a wide variety of reasons and whether or not that motivation is met is a key factor as to whether or not they'll have a good experience. The tricky thing though for those of us who work in the volunteer management space is that motivations do change over time. Um, so what that means is that we need to be constantly checking in with our volunteers and making sure that we're actually meeting their needs uh, and giving them opportunities to grow if that's what they're looking for. Um, and also recognising that people's motivations really differ um, and they can't be sort of a one-size-fits-all approach, which is a huge challenge for people who manage large volunteering programs. Um, but our guest speaker today is one of those, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to give you some really great tips on how you provide that personalised experience as well. And that is one of the other things that the evidence really shows. So there's some really fantastic Australian-based literature on um, the relationship between leadership and management and volunteer experience. And what we know from that is that there's sort of three main things that volunteers consistently cite as being part of their experience that is um, favourable. The first one is personalisation, so feeling like they're a part of the team, a part of the family, and that the role that they're doing has 
been potentially tweaked for them in their circumstances. And that's not to say that every single role needs to be designed for an individual person, but it's really about making accommodation so that a role can, can suit someone's circumstances, availability, and essentially what they want to do as a volunteer. The second one is around autonomy. Um, so volunteers really are looking to be upskilled in any area that they need to be and to be able to work autonomously um, with also social support. So whether that's support from volunteers alongside them or from paid staff within an organisation, people are really looking to make sure that there is a infrastructure, I suppose, that enables them to feel like what they're doing is part of the bigger picture. And then finally, the fourth main finding about the evidence around the volunteer experience is really around what managers of volunteers can do. And a lot of that is about relationship building. So making sure volunteers do feel like they're important to the organisation, creating flexible opportunities. Um, so as I mentioned before, finding accommodations for people that um, mean they can volunteer if they've got different circumstances in their life that mean that they can't necessarily just slot into a role. And also just, I think, fundamentally treating volunteers like human beings. Um, I think oftentimes in conversations around volunteering, um, you know, particularly at that policy and advocacy level, we sometimes tend to conceptualise volunteers as this like other group of people um, or sort of like, you know, they're all sitting around in a room out the back waiting for, to be given a job. We forget sometimes that volunteers are all of us. I'm a volunteer. I volunteer for three different organisations. Um, and when I put that hat on, it's a lot easier for me to recognise the things that I think make a good volunteer experience versus sometimes being in that more conceptual land where we think about volunteers almost as being another part of the population. And I always encourage people to think that if you're not a volunteer, you probably know one or are related to one or have been helped by a volunteer in the past. Um, and putting that personalised lens on it really helps you think through the factors of what would I be seeking from in a volunteer experience? And then how do I enable that for the volunteers in my organisation or for those I volunteer alongside? Um, and there are challenges, there are barriers, and uh, these are a lot of things we talk about in the national strategy. Um, um, but by focusing on the volunteer experience, we really have the opportunity to make sure that we bring people in, we make sure that they're happy and we keep them volunteering so that the huge benefits that we know from what it means to be a volunteer are continued to be recognised and supported in our communities. So that's a very fast overview of the strategic objective and focus area around this. And what we want to do to get the conversation rolling today uh, is do a bit of a quick poll. And I know that Zach's been doing these in other events as well. So I have been told this should all work reasonably automatically, but what we want to know from the people who have joined us online is basically how uh, you think about the volunteer experience in your organisation. So do you measure the satisfaction or experience of your volunteers? And there's four options here. And for anyone who is a volunteer but doesn't manage volunteers, um, think about how you're recognised. Um, and fill out the poll based on how often you receive recognition and sort of focus on your own volunteer experience. Um, and they should update pretty quickly. Um, and it's great to see that there are a high proportion of people who are saying that they're consistently measuring the volunteer experience. But we know it is something that we need some better metrics for and better ways to support organisations to be able to do in a more holistic manner. We know that volunteer managers are doing a thousand and one things oftentimes, and this is an area really where collectively we can put together a plan so that for those who find this challenging, we can basically upskill you and uptool you uh, to be able to do this more consistently. So I think most of the responses have pretty much come in now. Um, and you can see, uh, hopefully everyone can see in the chat like I can, those live results, you can see that there's uh, a bit of a mix of responses um, in terms of whether or not people are measuring that experience or not. So um, I'll hand back to Zach now, who's going to take us through what that actually looks like for organisations and how we can work together to do it um, better and more consistently across the ecosystem. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was that was excellent. And I, I really enjoy what you were talking about. I think it's a great reminder um, that so many of the things that we're looking for in the engagement of volunteers are, are really just elements from the rest of our life, you know, and, and you might look for progression in your paid work. Uh, and in the same way, many people would look for a sense of progression or um, evolution in their volunteer contributions as well. Um, and I can see the poll coming in. Sarah's exactly right. It's about half of people in this group say that they do consistently measure 
the satisfaction or the experience of volunteers that are engaged. Um, and then it goes down from there. About a third do measure it, but somewhat inconsistently. And then it's a minority that's saying there's no measurement at all. I would say from just anecdotal evidence of meeting with different organizations that this would represent a more highly engaged group uh, than a sample of all volunteer involving organizations everywhere. Shane has put in the chat, it'd be cool to have a national volunteer satisfaction survey. Totally agree. Um, I think that would be, I think that would be excellent. And this is one of the topics that's been discussed uh, with organizations in consultations and internally within Volunteering Australia. And of course it's come up before as well. Um, so absolutely love that idea. I think that's a that's a missing link in our understanding of volunteer experience across the board. So um now I'd like to both thank Sarah and also introduce uh, Katie Ronald from Bush Heritage Australia. So Katie is the National Volunteer Program Coordinator and is joining us today to share what uh, Katie and the team have been doing to focus on the volunteer experience within Bush Heritage Australia. So thank you, Katie. Take it away. Cheers. Thanks, Zach. And um, thanks very much for having me today. So yeah, as Zach mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the initiatives that Bush Heritage currently have in our volunteer program, and also some of the ones that we plan to develop that align with this focus area one. Um, before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and also extend that acknowledgement to any First Nations people who may be joining us today. Um, for me, I would like to acknowledge the Wajak people of Noongar Buja, where I am joining you from in Wulu or Perth. So the type of volunteering that Bush Heritage offers and the way that we offer it is quite unique. So I wanted to give you uh, a bit of a context into where we sit in the volunteering ecosystem. Bush Heritage are a leading not-for-profit conservation organisation who protect ecosystems and wildlife across Australia. We buy land for conservation and we partner with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the agricultural and environmental sectors. We currently own over 1.2 million hectares and we manage a further 11.3 million hectares in our partnerships. And out of that 1.2 million hectares that we directly manage, our volunteers are present on almost every one of our properties or reserves. And they're also present in every department within Bush Heritage. Our volunteer placements are only advertised to our registered volunteers, so, so they choose what they want to apply for. We currently have around 1,550 volunteers uh, in our database and across a 12 month period, about 600 of them are active. We offer episodic volunteering. So we've got episodic roles on our reserves from home and in our offices. So they have that defined start and end date, but we do also offer ongoing volunteering in our home and office based roles. So my team wrote our volunteer engagement strategy 2030 in 2022. And I wish we had waited one more year <laughs> for this strategy to be released. We referenced the 2011-2021 National Volunteering Strategy, but I found that the National Standards for Volunteer Involvement provided a better framework that we could align our strategy to. So a big project that we're going to be working on this year is documenting the alignments that we have now with this new National Strategy for Volunteering. But today is all about uh, this focus area one and it's three strategic objectives. Uh, how do we make volunteering inclusive and accessible? How do we ensure volunteers have a meaningful experience and how do we keep them safe? So this first strategic objective 1.1, we're looking at focusing on the volunteering experience, which is really, really important within Bush Heritage. Although we have a relatively large program, we try and personalise that experience as much as we can. We offer a really wide range of reward and recognition uh, options to our volunteers because we understand that everyone likes to be recognised in different ways. And volunteers are also highly valued within Bush Heritage from the top down. So we are given the resources within our team to, that we need to achieve the best results for our program. At Bush Heritage, we want to deepen and double our impact by 2030. So to do this, we are looking at new property acquisitions and we've just purchased our largest property in South Australia. So when I was reading through a strategic objective 3.4, which is recognising the importance of volunteer management, it helped me to build a case last year for additional resources to support growing our volunteer program in South Australia. If we want to focus on the volunteer experience, we want to know if your volunteers have got a voice. Do they have a say in the things that affect them? 
My team is supported by a volunteer advisory committee, which is made up of six experienced volunteers. We meet six times a year and they guide us and provide feedback on our procedures and our projects. They provide that volunteer voice to everything that we're doing. We used to meet face to face every two years uh, to workshop and prior look at priority projects we wanted to work through. But after I saw how valuable that face to face meeting was last year, I wanted to make it annual. So again, I used that same strategic objective 3.4, looking at the importance of volunteer management to build a business case so that we could meet every year. We can get better value out of our time together meeting face to face and we can get more done for the program. Other ways that we give volunteers a voice is that we survey them. Every two years, we survey our whole volunteer cohort and our staff about their experience with the volunteer program. We want to hear from placed and unplaced volunteers and staff who have and haven't supervised a volunteer. The results that you can see here are from our 2021 volunteer survey, um, and we're currently analysing our 2023 results at the moment. These surveys are a really important tool for us to have a thorough understanding of our volunteers and our staff's experience with our program. It helps us understand what motivates our volunteers to keep them coming back, what their barriers to volunteering might be. And we find out the successes that we can celebrate and the areas for improvement. We also provide post-placement surveys after each placement. These surveys provide that real-time feedback that we can action straight away, and they're also used to report our volunteering satisfaction rates to our board. And as well as identifying any issues that require immediate action, they give us the opportunity to provide this positive feedback to staff about the volunteers that they have just supervised. And it helps us to keep really high levels of engagement with our volunteer program across the organisation. This year, we'll also be running some survey results workshops with our volunteers for the first time. Uh, and this has been inspired by this strategic objective 1.1. We want volunteers to be more engaged with that biennial survey that we do, and we want them to understand how their responses have a direct impact on how we want to improve the program for them. In uh, 2023, we undertook a feedback review of all of our surveys, and we linked each question to the Bush Heritage 2030 strategy, our volunteer engagement strategy 2030, and to the National Standards for Volunteer Involvement. So a project we're going to be looking at this year is how we can then add those links between the questions and the national strategy for volunteering so we can identify any gaps in the questions that we're asking. We also have a team leader program that was set up a number of years ago where experienced volunteer team leaders supervise a group of volunteers to relieve time pressure for our staff. Although this program has been around for a while, it's not well utilised or well structured. So this strategic objective has really motivated us to review the program for uh, this year. We're going to widen the scope and we're going to set up better processes to support it because we want to support our volunteers in their leadership experience and to give them that autonomy in their roles. The next strategic objective is where we are trying to make the most changes with our home based volunteering. We already offer flexible volunteering options. Uh, we offer placements on our reserves from home or from our offices. This ensures that we're offering those different options that Sarah was talking about when people are at different times in their lives and looking at different things out of their volunteering. We want to increase the number of opportunities we can offer from home so we can reach more people. Volunteering with us is not just for able bodied people or people who can afford to be out in the bush for one to two weeks at a time. We want everyone who connects with our values and our vision to see a volunteer role for themselves with us. So how are we doing that? Within the organisation, we're listening, have our ear to the ground and we are involved in planning meetings, region gatherings. We are talking with different departments. We want to stay up to date with what's happening across the organisation. We want to know what their priorities are. What are the projects that they're working on? Because we are bringing that expertise as volunteer coordinators about where there might be a volunteer role in those projects that they may not have thought of. And we keep the volunteer program front of mind for our staff through writing articles for our staff newsletter or by presenting at our all staff meetings. And I love this quote from one of our volunteers. Uh, we have hundreds of motion sensor cameras across our reserves. Um, we use them to track populations of native and introduced animals. And Jane is a specially trained volunteer who manually validates images for us that weren't agreed upon by other volunteers. So even though she can't get out onto our properties as much as she used to be able to, she's still seeing those landscapes. She's still seeing the changes in them. Um, she's still seeing how what she's doing is affecting our work. And she knows that she's still making a really big difference to our conservation outcomes. 
We also try and involve our volunteers in our decision making processes wherever we can. Our volunteers are invited to participate in focus groups, webinars and lunchbox sessions that relate to topics about them or their volunteering. Last year, we partnered with a third party to conduct safety evaluation across the organisation. Volunteers participated in focus groups around their experience with our safety systems and the safety culture within Bush Heritage. Volunteers with reserve, office and home-based experience were involved so that all perspectives were being represented across that group. And that last strategic objective about ensuring volunteering is not exploitive. At Bush Heritage, our coordinators are the gatekeepers between our volunteers and our volunteer supervisors. They are the main point of contact for volunteers before and after the placement. And there's a number of reasons for this. When supervisors first approach us with ideas for how they want to engage with volunteers, our coordinators will go through with them what the requirements are going to be for that role. What, are the, what is the volunteer going to get out of it? We'll advise staff if their placement ideas aren't suitable for a volunteer and need to be resourced by a paid staff member. And we ensure that supervisors plan their placements really well to ensure that they are valuing the time of their volunteer. We want to make sure that our roles are meaningful and that they have benefits to the volunteer, not just the organisation. And we also try and avoid volunteers and supervisors contacting each other to organise their own placements because we don't want the volunteer or the supervisor feeling pressured to do more than they can and to take on more than they can. Last year, uh, sorry, in 2022, we started to receive inquiries from volunteers about the eligibility for our reimbursements. Volunteers were concerned about the rising cost of fuel and their ability to be able to continue volunteering in the field. So we worked on changes to the eligibility criteria so that more volunteers would be able to claim. The new procedure was released last year and these results are some of the preliminary findings from our 2023 survey. And they show a dramatic drop in the financial restrictions being a barrier to our volunteers, which was so rewarding to see because we spent so much time trying to get as many more people eligible for that reimbursement procedure as possible. And by work health and safety law, our volunteers are classified as workers alongside our staff. So they have the same supports in place to protect them, whether that's in the field, in the office or from home. For volunteers that are working from home, we provide them with the same ergonomic guidelines for setting up a home office that we provide our staff. All of our volunteers have access to our employee assistance program and we actively seek feedback on their safety. We want to know if they felt safe on their placements and if their volunteer supervisor was concerned for their safety. So what is next? Wherever you can, network with other volunteer managers broadly, but also from your industry, whether that's in conservation like me, in healthcare or in sport or in another service. Volunteering and conservation has got some really unique challenges. So I network and meet regularly with other like-minded organisations in conservation, but I also attend Volunteering WA's volunteer manager networking meetings because I want to keep up to date with the national trends in the volunteering ecosystem. Listen to your volunteers. What do they want? What are their aspirations? What do they want to achieve? And how does what you offer align with that? And how can you link what you are doing to that national strategy? In the past, I have shied away from these overarching strategies. I found them confusing. I found them difficult to read, but this one is so easy to digest. It's set up really well. It's a great starting point to measure your volunteer program against or to benchmark how your volunteer program is tracking. So this year, we're going to be using the national strategy to review our own strategy, and we're really looking forward to having this really well thought out document to align our own strategy to. We're going to be look, looking at linking the strategy to all of our surveys uh, from our biennial and our post placement surveys. And we also want to implement more defined measures of success for our own strategy. So we're going to be using the national strategy to guide that process as well. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. It's a very kind of brief snapshot of some of the things that we're doing, but I've just included my details there. If you'd like to get in touch to chat with me about any of that, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much, Katie. I, I think uh, everyone in the audience would agree with me that that was a fantastic uh, overview of very, very practical steps that an organisation could take to focus on the volunteer experience. Lots of topics there, very wide ranging, and I think we may have time if one or two people want to put a question in the in the chat, we may have time to um, just go to one of those and, and ask a question of Katie. Uh, while people are thinking, I'd like to ask you a question, Katie, which is you were talking about 
identifying, you know, obviously a lot of these um, actions, they are interrelated. And so when you're surveying volunteers about their experience, you identify this financial barrier that people were running into and increasingly running into, um, and you showed the results there. And one of the things you did was open up the reimbursement policy so that it could apply to the barriers that they're actually experiencing that affect their volunteering. Now, I think this is a situation that many managers and volunteers run into where there is a financial or tangible uh, request that they need to make, uh, and it might go beyond their normal budget. And they have to, they find they have to make the case to leadership, to perhaps the financial team, to the general manager or CEO, to the board, something like that. So um, I was wondering if you could just give a, a tip on how you made the case. Was it something where you did have to uh, present something for the organization leadership or were the leadership already searching for a solution to begin with? Yeah, it's a great question, Zach. So um, I did present a case to our senior leadership team uh, would be a couple, about 18 months ago now. Um, and I really looked at how it was going to affect the affect volunteering on the reserves. Our senior leadership team are really aware of the impact that our volunteers make on our properties. And we found that it was the not our remote reserves that were being impacted by this, but it was our reserves that are, say, three or four hours away from a capital city. Um, so they were the ones that the, they were the volunteers coming to us saying we just can't afford this to get out, you know, the four hour drive out to that property, the amount of fuel that it's taking. So uh, we looked at those properties and said, look, these are the properties that are being affected and we're not going to meet our conservation outcomes. We This is the number of placements that we had to cancel. This is the number of placements we weren't able to fill on these properties. Um, and that was really well supported. We looked at a lot of different options. Um, this was one of the projects we worked on at our face-to-face -face meeting with our volunteer advisory committee. And there was a lot of conversation around how to uh, increase the eligibility. Uh, we still will review it every year or so because there'll always be room for improvement. We want to include electric vehicles in it moving forward as well, uh, because that's not currently covered in it. As part of our bush heritage strategy, we will be increasing uh, having charging stations on some of our properties that are closer to cities and regional towns. So we will be making those changes to it. Uh, but yeah, it was really just getting the facts together and presenting it to our senior leadership team. Uh, and they were very supportive of it. The budgets don't actually sit with my team. The budgets for reimbursement sit with each of the reserve teams. So they're the ones mm. that are going to get impacted by not having their volunteers. So they will they will support the changes to it. Uh, and because they know that they're going to, they're not going to get their conservation outcomes achieved without them. Yeah. So the the need uh, and the solution were were heavily interlinked, and um, but there's still a lot of work in the meantime. And like you're talking about, needs to be. Con uh, consistently revisited as well. The volunteering and the volunteer experience isn't really the type of um, situation where we can go, yep, put a put a lid on that. It's it's fixed forever. You know, we've solved all our problems. Things evolve over time. We do have one or two other questions coming in the chat. I'll ask quickly as well. So Pauline have, uh, has asked how many people you have in your team. So let's say above the volunteer team leader level. Um, how many people would you say are in that volunteer coordination team? Yeah, so there are five of us. So I've got four volunteer coordinators who manage all of our field based volunteering uh, and they're spread out around the country. So we manage they manage a region each and they're all part time. We're all part time. And Olivia has asked about uh, the volunteer, the survey volunteer workshops. Um, could you just quickly let people know how you actually conducted surveys or workshops in person, online, email? Yeah, yeah. So what we've done in the past is the uh, that, that infograph that I had of the survey results, that was really all we communicated to our volunteers about the survey. Uh, and we, we didn't go into detail about what we were actually going to, we didn't go into too much, as much detail as I would like about what we were actually going to implement as changes. And we're finding that our response rate isn't as high as we want it to be. So we're hoping this will help increase that response rate by we're going to be hosting face-to-face -face workshops as well as online workshops. 
Um, we will all be in Melbourne in February. So we'll run our first one face to face with our Melbourne volunteers and we hold supporter events throughout the year in capital cities as well. So when any of us are traveling for those supporter events, that'll be the opportunity that we then do a workshop in that capital city uh, and go through in more detail. Look, this is what you told us. Um, this is the issues that you've identified. And now these are the projects that we want to work on to try and resolve some of those issues. Uh, and then I'll probably run, I'm looking at running two virtual workshops throughout the year as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, there are one or two other questions in there. I'd encourage, uh, Katie has obviously provided a contact detail, so I encourage people to reach out directly. Um, some of the other questions are excellent questions, but they might just be a bit of a long answer or, or very specific to uh, this program with Bush Heritage, and it's the type of thing we could talk about all day. So thank you so much, Katie, for for sharing your experience with us, sharing those tips. That was that was really amazing. Thank you. Um, from thank you. From here, I would like to share a few other examples from the volunteering ecosystem, from organisations who have met with us and told us what they've been doing that is aligned with the national strategy for volunteering, um, and in particular, focusing on the volunteer experience. So we met with the Salvation Army. Um, and so the Salvation Army Volunteer Resources Department did an engagement survey, and you can see 1,800 respondents. So that's a massive sample in terms of a volunteer survey. Of course, they're drawing on a large team, so there's a large volunteer population there, but we can all agree that 1,800 uh, respondents. That's a lot of information to be able to work with and analyze to try and find out more about the experience of volunteers. And a theme that's come up in what Sarah said and what Katie said is about aligning uh, some of the needs and analysis of how the volunteer experience is with what is happening with paid workers as well, with paid employees. And uh, the Salvation Army told us that they were looking at aligning those questions as well for better comparison of the data. And of course, in both cases, we're, we're dealing with people uh, and many, many, many paid employees volunteer outside of that paid role also. And so they let us know that this research can then inform the content of the Salvation Army's volunteer programs and improve the volunteer experience. You'll remember DJ Cronin joining us in a previous event um, and there are some members of the team, including Shane in the event here, um, and he talked about the Volunteer Impact Report. This is now out. I've had a look through it. It's fantastic to see. It's a great initiative, and especially for one of these organizations with many, many facets to what they do, many volunteer roles. And one of the things they did that can seem quite simple is to rename the team to be the Volunteer Experience Team. But when you give something a title, when you give something a name like that, you're really projecting what your priorities are and what, what's important to you. And I think that's really valuable. So I encourage people to check out United K Queensland's Volunteer Impact Report, um, which was uh, informed by the National Strategy for Volunteering. And so to sum things up, you know, what can you do? You can consult the volunteers, you can identify barriers, you can ensure roles align with volunteer needs, and you can track those changes to the experience. You saw Katie share that in terms of the financial barriers that people were running into. They saw that change, uh, which was the success of changing their reimbursement policy. Health and safety is an important thing. Um, you might remember May joined us from Vinnie's WA, and that was one of their metrics for the volunteer experience, was minimizing health and safety issues. You can support volunteers by improving accessibility and inclusion, uh, and focus on relationship building and those other key tenants that we talked about before. What I'd like to do now is bring things back as well to the national strategy and the trajectory that we're on. So we're in the establishment phase currently, and one of the things that we're doing is co-designing actions and measures to secure the strategy's future and maintain this momentum of the actions that are already taking place. So we've been consulting stakeholders, and that consultation continues today. Uh, we're going to be asking you some questions as well. So just as you saw a poll pop up before, um, the rest of this session, we're going to be asking you your thoughts and to share your experiences, what your organization or what you as an individual are looking at and what is relevant and most important to you. So one of the outputs of the establishment phase is the first three year action plan 
obviously action is taking place. We've heard many examples today, but there are still so many benefits to an action plan to coordinate activity, to guide, and to ensure that there's an entry point for all stakeholders across the volunteering ecosystem. So we're going to have another poll pop up for you and similar to the one before, and this is asking, have you or your group taken an action or taken any action that's influenced by the national strategy? So this might be a new thing that you've done. Uh, it might be that you've added the national strategy and its framework to something you have done previously or something that was already underway. Maybe you've referenced it in a grant application or something like that. Um, and please feel free to share a few details in the chat as well. We'd love to hear from you and to share and celebrate those examples, um, including if it's something that you intend to do. And we can see that's one of the top responses here is uh, people who intend to do something aligned with the national strategy for volunteering, but they haven't done it just yet. But we are seeing as well a quarter of people in this room have done something uh, inspired or influenced by the national strategy for volunteering. So that's excellent to see. Uh, please feel free to put something in the chat there um, so that we have more uh, practical examples coming in that we can share with people as well. Because I think when you see like for like examples that speak to your organization's experience and your needs, that really helps you brainstorm and imagine uh, what you could be doing in the future to achieve your own strategic goals and to achieve that vision of the national strategy for volunteering. So something that uh, we'd like to discuss now as well is the action plan. And so some for some people, the idea of an action plan might be something that you haven't interacted with before. So I just want to share the idea of what an action plan is that would help achieve the national strategy for volunteering. In this case, we have three three-year action plans that define the uh, nine years at the end of the national strategy following this first year establishment phase. So it's a defined set of tasks. They're often assigned to particular individuals or teams or stakeholders that achieve a goal. And I've put up two relevant examples here on the screen for you. You can see that there's an example here from the Sport Volunteer Coalition. And then there's those colored dots on the side there that identify who would be responsible for this particular action. There's another one from the Western Australian Volunteering Strategy Action Plan, and you can see in there they've identified the Department of Communities as leading this particular action, Action 1.4, and it provides more detail there. And so this is going to be one of the outputs of the National Strategy for Volunteering in the establishment phase, and there's going to be um, actions for all sorts of stakeholders across the volunteering ecosystem and commitments that are being made uh, by volunteer involving organizations, communities, governments, all sorts of relevant groups and peak bodies uh, to the national strategy. So with this in mind, thinking about the action plan, I'd like to ask you, how could this type of action plan assist you? So we could be thinking about your uh, volunteering goals, your current needs, or ways to implement the national strategy and achieve its vision. So we should have a pop up coming up now, which is a word cloud. And so you can type in a response here or multiple responses, and then we'll be able to see some common themes emerge from the word cloud where answers have overlapped. So it really helps if you keep them to a few words so you can um, maximize how much overlap you have with other people. So if you're thinking about the benefits an action plan would offer you, what would that be? Uh, some examples that are coming in are making the case to senior management, to guide your thinking, to set goals, to help your organization understand the national strategy and the actions that need to happen. Uh, focus and clarity. Um, we have identifying gaps. That's a really important one as well. Setting goals is the runaway favorite here. You can see it's the biggest one as well as focus. So we're really talking about informing clarifying, focusing, and being able to put specific actions and measures into your forward plans for your organization or project plans, things like that. This is excellent. I'm seeing as well, giving a voice to volunteers and sharing common goals with others across the volunteering ecosystem. Uh, this is excellent here. So thank you so much for sharing. You can continue typing things in there. I know a few people are. Um, and in fact, we did somewhat anticipate 
that those would be some of the key answers. And so in this next slide here, we're asking the same question, but talking about those different uh, benefits that an action plan offers you, we'd like you to in fact rank them. Uh, so you should see a pop-up that allows you to either drag options up or down, or you can click an arrow within the rectangle to move things up and down. And you've got a few options here. So we'll be popping up in a moment. Same question, how could a national strategy for volunteering action plan assist you? And we've split it up into a few categories here, which have come up in that word cloud. So making a case to internal leadership, connecting with peers, providing clarity on what comes next in the strategy, being recognized as a person or a group who is working with the national strategy to strengthen volunteering, to generate new programs that you haven't done before, um, or to tweak or refine your existing programs and initiatives. And so we should have that popping up in a moment. Um, if we run in, here it comes. And so you should have a pop-up, um, or if you're on a phone or tablet, it may appear slightly differently. And these are these ranked options. If the view is cut off for you in any way, you can refer to the slide there. And so you can click arrows or drag them up and down um, in terms of what order of priority these have for you. And there's a few options there. Um, as well, I see a question come in that, thank you, Sarah, you've addressed it, but I'd just like to read it out loud as well for those who can't see the chat. Uh, we will be sharing the results and, and the ideas that you're talking about here in the post-event email, uh, which will come out with the event recording. So you'll be able to go back and, and revisit those examples, uh, what Sarah shared before and what Katie shared also. So I'm going to rank uh this according to what we're doing within our team at volunteering australia um as well and if you think about what is the priority it can be tricky to pick between them um but let's let's see what type of responses we have here the key one that has emerged as the top answer so far is providing clarity on what comes next as well as making a case to internal leadership uh, within your group, within your organization. And that's often the case for managers of volunteers who operate within some sort of volunteer department, uh, but then there are other departments in parallel. And sometimes you have to make the case reaching across the aisle there um, or upwards towards the CEO, financial team or, or general managers. Um, we can see as well, typical to volunteering and because and it also didn't appear much in the word cloud people being quite selfless in terms of not prioritizing being recognized um, publicly as a group that is working with the national strategy to strengthen volunteering i think that's really a a key thing in the volunteering ecosystem that we see time and time again people want to give their time to work towards the common good um, they're not necessarily in it for trophies and glory and that sort of thing but that said we do still want to focus on sharing examples where we can when they can help inform others or connect peers i'm sure a few of you are going to reach out to katie after today's event uh, because of her fantastic examples she gave and so when we recognize people contributing to the national strategy that's one of the benefits as well Thank you so much for sharing your answers there. Uh, we had 74 people rank some choices there, uh, and I've given people a bit of time to finish that off, but we'll just move on for now uh, for those who finished it very quickly. So what I'd like to ask you in this next question is imagine that we're in the three-year action plan. Now, and I've put the strategic objectives as a recap on the right-hand side there so you can see them. And of course, there's a lot more material on all of this within the national strategy itself. So let's imagine we are in the first three year action plan. You or your group are working or you're doing something, some action, whether it's new activity or something you've aligned that you already do with the national strategy to achieve the vision or strategic objectives. What comes to mind as the thing that you would be doing in that hypothetical situation? This could be, what's the low hanging fruit that's available to you? So I'll ask you to please just put some answers in the chat for this one of what occurs to you. So what could be the thing that's in front of you? What could be something that is inspired by the National Strategy for Volunteering? What could be something that you would love to partner with 
uh, peak bodies or peers, other volunteer involving organizations, other volunteers to achieve? Or what things do you think need to happen to achieve that vision, to achieve these strategic objectives? Um, these can be rough guesses. You can phrase them however you choose. But uh, one example could be, drawing on today's examples, that uh, the example Shane shared earlier of there being a national uh, survey that's available that uh, helps people understand the volunteer experience, volunteer satisfaction and barriers they encounter. That could be one that there is a national survey that you could pick up and run with so you can compare how your team uh, has their experience in a national perspective and compare that with other teams. So there's no pop up for this one. It's just within the chat. Please feel free to put something in there of whatever occurs to you. I'll share another example, which could be that there are uh, more opportunities for like minded groups, individuals, managers of volunteers to be able to sign up to an action together um, and work on something um, in collaboration. We can see some answers coming in here. Aaron said, focus on the volunteer experience. Uh, Pauline's talking about reshaping the public perception. Olivia's talking about surveying volunteers with completed roles that previously did not exist. And this is really important. We can think about when there was the onset of COVID-19, suddenly a lot of our roles shifted to work from home roles. All of a sudden we need to have a different understanding of the volunteer experience because they're running into different barriers and we need to adjust our approach. Angela said that uh, recognizing the value of volunteering would be the place to start. Um, and we can see as well, survey and recognition of volunteering and acknowledging what's been achieved so far. So please feel free to continue putting things in the chat there. I'm gonna expand on this a little bit in terms of actions that could live within an action plan. Um, Cause it's not always something that we have time to do to generate this new activity because volunteers, managers of volunteers and volunteer organizations are often under-resourced and overworked. So what barriers do we run into that make it difficult for us to contribute to these actions? This is gonna appear as a word cloud again, so this will be another pop-up. In the pop-up, we're looking for the barriers that we run into that prevent us from taking these strategic actions or setting up a new strategic plan or uh, reaching out to our peers, peak bodies and working with them. What barriers do we run into there? While that comes in, uh, I'm gonna continue just reading out some of the excellent suggestions that are coming in the chat here. Um, so being part of groups that work together on specific areas of the strategy, I think that's excellent. Telling the story of volunteers, sharing their stories, sharing their experiences to shape the perception of volunteering. So it could be easy for people to believe that uh, environmental conservation is less accessible to people who have accessibility requirements. But from what Katie was talking about before, we know that actions can be taken, new programs can be set up that make it more inclusive, more accessible to more volunteers. We can see that among the barriers that people are putting into the word cloud, of course, time, uh, is phrased in many ways, time, lack of time, little time, and busy time constraints. Very, very common thing that prevents us from doing all these things that we want to do uh, on the wish list. Um, we can see as well an, a level of understanding of volunteering and the volunteering ecosystem. Some people are reporting a lack of support. This could be from within other areas of the organization um, and or perhaps it could be more broadly. Um, and others are talking about funding as being a potential barrier as well. Or someone has expanded on that and said the politics around funding uh, can be something that creeps into that also. So time being the real um, major barrier that people would in here. And in fact, this is where I'd like to go back to what Katie was talking about before as well, that the national strategy for volunteering can be a time-saving measure where some of these things that you want to do 
a lot of the material you'll find already in there within the national strategy document. There's research that you can cite. Uh, there's language that you can take and adapt to be your own. And a key thing is we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So time is going to be remain a barrier within volunteering. Always, we know that. Uh, but there are things we can do to create efficiencies and shortcuts. And uh, one of them would be extracting value that works for you and your mission from the National Strategy for Volunteering. Thank you so much for sharing all those answers. And we get to save those as well. And there's going to be many, many, many more opportunities for consultations throughout this year. Um, and so please subscribe to the newsletter, follow us on the website, and keep an ear and an eye out for these opportunities to participate. Uh, Deborah's asked, how can we rewatch this webinar? There'll be a, a link shared uh, in a follow-up email, which will come out once the recording has been edited and it's available. Uh, that'll be shared to everyone who signed up for today's session. So as we bring today to a close, I'd like to bring back this slide we had before about what can you do when we're thinking about the volunteer experience and within the National Strategy for Volunteering. Here are some dot points that talk about some of the things we've heard today. I showed this earlier. So you can consult volunteers in your team about the volunteering experience. The best way to find out is to ask. Uh, ask what motivates your volunteers so you can ensure their roles align with the volunteers' needs and motivations. Identify and remove those barriers. A barrier that you've identified and removed bef uh, before it was run into is a barrier that doesn't exist from the perspective of the volunteer. Lana said that screening of volunteers is a barrier with uh, some of their requirements. And yeah, this can be very difficult, um, especially for any groups that operate across state boundaries, because there can be two sets of requirements that you have to fulfill. Um, of course, as you're understanding the needs and barriers of the volunteers that you're working with, track changes to that over time. Is the experience getting better or has the situation evolved so that uh, the barriers you were previously addressing are no longer the key barriers. And in fact, now the story has changed a little bit. You can address health and safety concerns. You can improve accessibility and inclusion. Uh, think about what volunteer, what gaps exist within your volunteer team that you work with and uh, who can you open the door to to get more people in by making the roles more accessible to their life situation. And of course, as uh, there'll be many volunteer coordinators and managers in this room and leaders of volunteers. And we can focus on relationship building, listening to volunteers, giving them an opportunity for the voice, like Katie mentioned before about those forums and workshops, and also communicating the impact and the essential role that they have within your organization and to your mission. I'd like to thank you today for all those excellent contributions that came in. I'd really like to thank as well the co-presenters, uh, Sarah and Katie. And I'd like to uh, thank as well a team that you don't often get to see in these, which is we have several people behind the scenes that are in this event that help make it possible. Uh, Anna, Ludna, Kylie, uh, you'll remember Jack from previous events. There are many, many people that make um, this knowledge sharing, this webinar possible. So thank you so much for that. But thank you as well for your, your time, your attention, and uh, the energy you've shared with us today through those excellent suggestions and sharing your story. Please stay tuned and we'll see you at the next one. Uh, but please get in touch with us in the meantime if, if there's anything you'd like to discuss. All the best.